Is it okay for us to get started? Is everyone ready? <laughs> well, it's my pleasure to introduce Chastity to you um, and, and the Amplify program. And she brought with her um, Wendy. Wendy, yes, Wendy. Yes, uh, Wendy is the Southeast. Yes, I'm the Southeast um, Regional Manager. Yes, ma'am, I am. And this is Jeff Daniel. I'm Jeff. Okay, yeah. and uh, Jeff works with the product development. Mm -hmm. So we can ask really tough questions. Sure. You know, the answer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, know I almost forgot about Alexandra, who would like to join virtually. virtually. Do you, can I get on your Wi Fi real quick? Mm -hmm. okay. If you just open it up, you should be on. Okay, it's pretty cool. slick. Yeah. She is our uh, general manager for product development, just in case y'all have questions for her. So y'all yeah. can. I'll yeah, she wanted to join. She's kind of our uh, head of uh, ELA for grade six to eight. So, so you can. And I encourage her to join because uh, when I heard that word, tough questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you heard correctly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, I just appreciate um, Chastity Sorry, I totally forgot. fielding my questions, and and then um, as it turned out, she was. I guess you got onto the nice longer website. And realized she had a connection with Dr. Bales and with uh, Mary Nail, so um, we were excited then to learn, have this opportunity to learn more about this new product. Um, we had kind of a, and it, we had our check-in this morning with um, Friday Institute and learned that one of the ladies from Friday Institute, Teresa, that works with us, was actually someone who helped. Uh, early on in the product development for the middle school, the graphic novel part of it. Oh, oh so, great. Wow. so that was like, oh, well. Friday Institute is a group of UNC, oh, University of North Carolina. North yeah. Carolina State. State. The state, mm -hmm. yeah. And okay. we're partnered with them on professional development and that kind of thing. Oh, excellent. Oh, that's great. But wow. We do have three of our academic coaches. We have nine total. We serve 17 or 18 districts, 36 schools the first two years, and 36 the next two. But three of our academic coaches are here, and if everybody wants to just introduce themselves and what they do, then that'd be great. Linda, we'll start with you. I'm Linda Stewart. I have four schools and working with uh, as few as almost 50 to as many as 200. Wow, just you yourself. Wow. Yes. Wow. And we have four academic coaches. <laughs> how are you? How are you? I'm missing you. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Ben Wilson. I'm an assistant principal. Ben Willings, uh, also one of the academic coaches working with four schools. Uh, and, I, and I have one school in particular that's considering Amplify, so I want to be here and take good notes and ask those hard questions. Yeah. Okay. I'm Richard Kissmiller, project director. Retired superintendent. I'm Allison Seeley. Try to all of my snacks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an academic coach. <laughs> also have four schools. That's about it. I'm just glad Sarah's here to ask more, hard, even yes. harder questions. <laughs> 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 I'm John Payne, the technology director for the grant. I'm Richard Bales, Director of Instructional Practice and Retired Superintendent. Pam Holden, um, Literacy and Communication Coordinator. And, oh, and I'm Sarah Kitzmiller, and I'm an uh, instructional coach with the grant. And how many schools do you work with? I'm at four schools. Four schools, okay. So that seems like that's Our the common most. Yeah. Yeah, everybody schools. has four. Okay. And okay. the schools range, we serve students in six, seven, and eight, and from a total of about 40 kids to 1,200 kids. So the schools vary in size mm -hmm. greatly. Mm -hmm. So it's all the schools, I guess, north and east of Jefferson, Sevier. Pretty much everything from Knox County mm -hmm. toward yeah. the corner. And over in the two groups of 36, the treatment schools and the control schools, we're looking at a little over 19,000 students, just middle school. Wow, fantastic. Hmm. Great. Great. Yeah. Awesome. One of my schools is also has already been in contact with all of with you guys at Pittman Center. Okay. And have received the quote, but we're hoping y'all can bet. Just a little plug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree.
particularly um, we're looking at improving literacy, but through personalization. Um, so, you know, hopefully empowering students to um, take, con you know, take ownership and have so that, and also to give them choice uh, in what they're reading and how they're progressing. So, um, it's literacy partnered with personalization. And I think Jeff will do a great job, maybe, and if it's, we would love to let you all kind of be in control of the meeting, and please, you know, if you have questions, those hard questions, that's why I say I, I brought in the big guns here, um, <laughs> too. Um, I am a former teacher, and this was my first principal. <laughs> He was the best, too, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> he, um, I have to tell a story. I think I told um, Pam. Sitting in that interview, um, looked at me across the table and said, you don't have 85% of your kids reading. Maybe it was 87. I don't remember. It was 87. Kids reading this first year, you will not have a job next year. Do you understand me? Do you understand me? Now, do you know what I'm saying here? You did, though, didn't you? I did. Yes, I did. That's what I was going to all day long. <laughs> Jeff will um, answer, hopefully, give you a little bit of um, the program overview first. And um, again, we just want to let you all kind of direct how the meeting's going to go. So. All right. So, um, well, thank you very much for having us. Yeah. This is this is great. I also live in Tennessee, but I kind of live over in the Nashville area. Uh, Work with Ample Five for a while. Worked in um, ELA curriculum, and I'm really curious. At, you know, this this obviously came up very very quickly, <laughs> and so <laughs> I was able just to get on the website and look at a few things. So, like, can you tell me a little bit about um, uh, the grant and how this is set up and, and uh, what your team does? A little bit. If you want. You know, Go ahead. I, this is this I'm is really an going. interesting situation. Yeah. We. Uh, we had a federal grant a few years ago that worked with 30 high schools, and, okay. and it was very successful. But one of the things that we learned from that was um, we're sustaining a lot of the high school work, but they said we need to start earlier. So we need so we we've been playing with the project, and and we we've we pitched it uh, to the federal level two or three times, and finally. We wrote a proposal that worked. So we're we're looking, as Pam said, we're looking to thinking that literacy was the core. I mean, they you know they need to get it in K3, but if they don't get it in K3, we aren't giving up on them. We're going to continue, and even the even the high flyer kids can 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 do more than our middle schools currently do in literacy. So we focus on literacy. Uh, and, and that's broadly defined. It can be literacy in science, literacy in social studies. It's not just ELA classroom. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to improve literacy for all students, uh, and, uh, and we're using personalized learning, thinking that you can't do, there's only so much you can do with whole, lab, whole group instruction. Mm -hmm. So personalization has to be a tool, and it's quite possible that technology will be a tool. But the goal is, is literacy. And uh, and so uh, you know that's that's what we're trying to do. We pitched it to the federal government, and and uh, we were one of six six grants funded in the mid phase EIR grant. So this is uh, um, you know this is it was a competitive thing, and and uh, we were we consider ourselves very fortunate. We probably got it mostly because we're serving a rural audience, you know, as opposed to that we hit the niche for that. So. The majority of our schools are rural, and we have, uh, and because it's a federal research grant, we have to do it uh, in the research design with the uh, treatment schools and control schools. So, so that's what we have. We and so we we will be doing not only a control group, but they get a deferred implementation. 
so so we're doing the study for two years and then we'll study we'll track it on but we'll give this the control group a similar treatment in years four and five of the grant yeah or years okay for the schools it seems like this is we're starting year one for the schools uh, so one and two and then uh, three and four uh, yeah three and four for the control schools so now, this is, this and I will, I, yeah. I, I'll add that each school is assigned an academic coach. That's the bulk right. of their yeah. resource. And, but they also have to do, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. They, all, <laughs> they go also ahead. have to do a, an individualized literacy plan for their school. Yes. And there's dollars that they can tie to that for approval by this office to be able to spend on literacy improvement. So, so the yeah. schools could decide to work on their struggling readers or providers. Mm -hmm. or they could decide to work on reading cross content areas, or they could decide to work on getting teacher leaders up to speed and hoping it will spread. So they have a choice of what to do. So we have 36 different school plans wow. that we're filtering through, but all of them have to have to be geared toward personalization and literacy. And, of course, literacy, while it encompasses reading, writing, speaking, and listening, most of the schools have chosen to work on reading. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them with writing too, but most of them, the majority of them have, are focusing on reading. Wow, it's, it's all encompassing. It's content, a lot of professional development, I can imagine. So as coaches, what's your day look like? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I know, yeah. So, so far, I mean, we're, we're just in, really in week one in a lot of the schools right now. So, so this is just kicked uh, off, okay. So, I mean, as far as students being mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And so, uh, a lot of my time so far has been building relationships. I'm in four new places. Yeah. Um, kind of kind of getting an idea of how my teachers teach, how the school day runs, uh, but also helping them finish finalizing these plans and submitting them. Um, and then once whatever it is that they decide to use for these plans uh, becomes to go into place, I'll be there in support of that also. Uh, I was talking to a principal this morning and he said hey we've we've pushed play we've ordered some stuff it should be coming in soon and i said well as soon as it's in let's get some of it in my hands and i'll become an expert so okay. so i can help you implement it here so and support yeah, like thinking support. about how to systematically support teachers in making good decisions regardless of who's in their class about literacy and in particular supporting rigor and what rigor looks like and if i can't be there four days out of the five day yeah. week how can that support be in place so that when they are making decisions on their own, they feel confident in the decisions that they're making, if that makes sense? Yeah. So do you look at things like curriculum maps and um, assessments and if that kind of thing? If they're available. That's what I've been doing all day. Yeah. That's what you've been doing all day. Okay. Yeah. If they're available. If they're available. Okay. Okay. So. Um, and you have to think every school is in a really different place in terms of their literacy instruction, not only in terms of their performance, but in terms of their resources and their knowledge base, and um, so you're really in 36 <laughs> different places. Yeah, so in those, in those 36 um, places that you're in, the instructional coaches then offer this degree of consistency, right, mm -hmm. which you have. Um, are you thinking then, thinking about Amplify, that having some consistency of instructional materials could support that as well then? I mean, is that where you're coming from here? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's simple. Yes. Yes. Because I bet with four, even in your four schools that you had, they're probably all over the map is, in terms of what they're using, in terms of. Uh, the school. I'm lucky, I guess, yeah. because I have three schools in one county. And oh. Okay. They're supposed to have. Emphasizing some place to have. The, um, <laughs> the same curriculum map, the same okay. pacing guide. However, it's kind of a little willy nilly. Okay. So they're trying to rein it in and, and figure out what can they really use and and I think a lot of the middle school teachers are rethinking how they teach units and it's a little bit different coming down the pike about how they're supposed to be looking at that yes and so I think that that's something that they're trying to grasp how to learn to tie things together more and that's something that I realized with the teachers I've been working with that they are really needing help how to tie the writing informational text the literature are they still, do you have a lot of teachers who are still um, teaching by genre in a lot of cases? Like we're going to teach all our short stories now and then we're going to read a novel and then we're yes. going to read some poetry and yeah, that's I pretty think, common. And I think it, well, mm -hmm. it's, I'm, 
I don't have this gig. I'm normally a high school teacher, and that's and we lucky that I work in a system that we had already been doing kind of these thematic units yeah. where that's how you think of it yeah. automatically. And so it's been interesting to see where the middle schools are. By the way, all of our coaches are on loan from districts within the region for a year. Oh, and wow. So they're working. Yeah. Um, for the foundation for this grant for a year, yeah. and they're online. So they're still employed by the district. Okay. But by design, we didn't make it where we implemented a model on the schools. Yeah, but absolutely. If it bubbled up, mm -hmm. that that a consistency across, I mean, we that would be fine, but we didn't want to impose a consistent curriculum. We wanted it to, to you know, if it, if it made sense to the school, then it would be part, part of what we, uh, support it, but we did we did not want to tell them you must do it this way. So now, how does technology play a role in this? In everybody, wants yeah. everybody, <laughs> everybody wants Chromebooks. Everybody wants Chromebooks. Everybody okay. wants everybody Chromebooks. Wants Chromebooks. <laughs> I'm sure. Then the next question is, are they going to get Chromebooks? Where are they with that? I mean, is that a possibility? Again, again you've got 36 different yeah. places, with, and they're all at different places. Okay. But from my perspective, John, what do you? Th you may want to talk this. I think they're in mm -hmm. good shape, or will be, technology-wise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Technology-wise, in terms of having student devices and having the yeah. bandwidth yeah. to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's Great. That's fantastic. Because a lot of the rural schools have leveraged e rate Oh, they have okay. A high yeah. percentage of free and reduced. So yeah. Where they're able to leverage e rate and get network infrastructure mm -hmm. in. At least the ones I've talked to. That's yeah. that's great. To hear. So. Yeah. The, the infrastructure is. Pretty much there. We've been, and in, and many of the schools have one to one or heading that way. But some of the schools are using money to to flesh out the number okay. of devices. Good, good. So there's this, there's that whole other side of this then with you as far as helping teachers to implement that and implement that effectively. Then. It's not well, just the curriculum. But well, and it's a two-way street of like, what what does mastery look like exactly? Yeah, absolutely. And then now we're we need to figure out how to hold that in our head as well as personalize it. Does that make sense? Yes. So like when you think about small group or independent work, uh, how can, you know, programs offer text that we may not have in our libraries that if we're rural okay. or, or items that we may not have access to um, that will allow us to work towards our mastery path or our path to mastery. Every school also has at least one lead teacher. Mm -hmm. Some of the large ones have two who are sort of the go-to person when the coach isn't there. But a lot of the PD that we've already done this summer was not that we want a Chromebook in everybody's hands, but what are we doing in terms of literacy? Yeah, yeah. And then how can we use that Chromebook? Right. That's exactly to right. Use yeah. That. yeah, the device isn't going to solve the issue. Right. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so from Amplify ELA, uh, I can kind of walk you through the program, but before that, is there anything specific that you came in here with that you make want to make sure that we cover? Differentiation. Differentiation. Okay. And, and again, personalizing the learning. How can we take either tier tier one content and personalize okay. it, and or tier two? And okay. Personalization. What else? How many of you have seen Amplify before? I think we got on and played a little yeah, bit. You got on and played a little bit. It's kind <laughs> of soft. As far as we could go. Okay. Um, it, do you want to see it? Yes. What do you think? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stand up because I move around a lot when I do this. I was, um, uh, my students didn't like that very much. I was all over the room. But um, Amplify ELA is a, a program, and this is what's so great about this and thinking about it. Amplify ELA is a program that's specifically designed for grades six through eight. It wasn't a program that started as a high school program and then got pushed down into middle school or as an elementary program that was expanded into middle school. The idea of Amplify ELA is to specifically, very similar to your grant, specifically target critical years. And we know these years are really critical, right? It, it comes from, um, there's a whole lot of research behind this. I'm sure you know this research way better than me. But as students enter middle school, their motivation to read begins to decline. And it's interesting because we see middle school teachers, I'm sure the teachers that you work with, spend a tremendous amount of time trying to figure out how to engage, right? How to connect them to uh, the importance of what they're reading. 
because there's just this level of interest that dies down. And in fact, Scholastic actually did a really interesting study. Look at this. 32% of 11-year-olds read books for fun every day. Are you surprised by that number, 32% at 11? Would you think it would be higher or lower? Lower. 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 I did too. When I saw this at first, I thought, you know, 11-year-olds, 11 11-year-olds 11 I know, reading books every day for fun, actually picking up a book. But this was done in 2014, so it's pretty recent research. 32% of 11-year-olds read books for fun every day. But look what happens by the time they get to 15 that number moves to 14%. So what happens in the time between a, a person is 11 and a person is 15? What happens in that four years? Middle school. Middle school. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Middle school. This, that's the really important critical year. And there's all kinds of factors, obviously, involved in that. You've got um, just, the, just the normal adolescence that happens. You've got distractions. But there's also this change in academic attitude, right? Middle school uh, can be a lot of times preparation for high school. And most teachers who are using middle school uh, ELA programs are using a program that was actually designed for high school that has been pushed down to sixth grade. Or, um, or they're finding it very difficult to maintain, as you, as you know, that engagement. In, t in students. So Amplify saw this as a huge opportunity. And Amplify being a, uh, a tech company with a lot of educational exports, uh, experts um, thought about it this way. We started looking at this one question. And I'm sure it's a question that you look at too <laughs> when you're working with your teachers. How do we inspire students to read the text? Not read the text to the students. How, because what happens a lot of times in middle school is they learn to play the game, and they can answer the questions correctly without reading, right? They learn how to get around it, especially with technology. Mm -hmm. Students learn to get around it. But, if, but reading is such, a, it's such an amazing experience that a person has when, when you think about those great so stories or books that you've read, that feeling that you get where you don't want to put that down. We want that with our students. How do you inspire that to happen? And that's really the central question around building Amplified ELA. And so the mantra behind it is this. Great text. It's not text specifically designed for middle school students. We want middle school students reading great pieces. We want middle school students reading pieces that will challenge them. Not, you know, every, every story doesn't have to be about skateboarding. <laughs> You know, because it's because these are middle school kids, but it's, it's getting kids into great text with engaging lessons and tools that really help teachers be awesome. That's the thing with middle school teachers want uh, middle school teachers are amazing, and we want them we want to provide them with the tools to help them have amazing days. And then this big one, trying and failing and improving until it works which is similar to what the work that you are doing with these schools. We're going to try something, and we're going to revise it. Amplify ELA has been out for a few years, but it changes all of the time. It changes all the time. If you decide, you know, if, you, if your schools decide to go with Amplify ELA this year, and they stick with it through the five years of the grant, by that fifth year, the program may look entirely different from the program that they started with but I guarantee it's going to be better. That's what happens. Um, we're kind of obsessed with that concept, obsessed with getting better, and obsessed with that data. Um, and one of those things that we figured out, we really uh, predicated the entire program on, is designing lessons specifically for middle school students, rather than taking lesson plans that were designed for high school, like American Lit and Brit Lit, and pushing them down, or taking elementary uh, an elementary lesson plan framework and building it up. So each lesson begins with independent work where students build vocabulary. And they do that on an app. And that is a, it's an app that is adaptive. So when you're talking about personalized learning, the first thing that students do, and it's really important, you know, for middle school students to have that routine. When they walk into an Amplify classroom, they sit down and they get to work on the app. And some kids want to get to work on the app. We see it all the time. 
in the class previous to what they're doing, and they can work on it then, or they can work on it at home if they want, because it's independent, and it's personalized, and it is adaptive. It includes the words from the selections that they happen to be reading, but it also, because of the algorithm that it uses, challenges them with words that are simple. It learns the way that they learn vocabulary, and, it, and they build that vocabulary, and all that data is tracked for the teacher. But that happens every day. The students walk in, boom, they're on the vocabulary app. And then they get into the text. They get into short chunks of text. They don't, it's not a situation where you have teachers saying, okay, today we're going to read Ricky Tiki Tabby for the full 55 minutes of class, and then tomorrow we're going to keep reading Ricky Tiki Tabby because we didn't finish it today, right? Instead, they work with a small chunk of text that they're reading from a really critical selection in a collaborative way. They work in pairs, they work in small groups and collaborate, and they interpret that text, and then they develop and they present ideas together on what that text means and how it, and they interpret that text as well, and then they communicate that. But then it's time for them to step back and reflect after they've done that. So they step back and reflect either in a quick writing piece or in a quick conversation or just sometimes in another piece or, or a, a deeper uh, dive into the text where they apply what they've learned. And then finally, it's time for some independent work. In Amplify, that's called a solo, okay, where students then solo. And this lesson design occurs every day. So it gives students the solid routine that they need. The activities vary in each chunk of that lesson, except really for that vocabulary app. That's kind of, the, it kind of remains consistent. And teachers like that because it's an expectation. Students come in, they sit down. That allows teachers to do things like take roll and kind of get adjusted for the day, and students are on task. But this design is really important because I, I was a middle school teacher for two years, and I had an amazing principal. And his evaluation, he had this big, long evaluation form, but he said at the end of it, you know, after my very first day, um, the very first time he came in to evaluate me, we sat down and he said, you did three things right. And if you do these three things right, your students are going to learn. And it was talk, move, mess <laughs> for middle school. If my kids, if your kids are talking to one, to each other, and it's academic discussion, and if you get them moving around, because middle school kids need that movement, they need time to do that, and if they're making a mess, sometimes that's a good thing. We want that to be a productive mess. And so if I see tall move mess, <laughs> we're doing well. But it's the idea of building lesson plans that provide that kind of stimulating activity, not just sit down and read. It's a little different, and that happens every day. Now the program itself, as I said, the concept of trying and failing and getting better happens all the time. We have. Um, there are six units in each grade level, and I'm going to give you an example here from grade eight, from unit C, liber liberty and equality. Some of these units change from time to time, but one of the pieces that we really want students to read in eighth grade, because um, eighth grade is also U.S. history, so uh, there's this great tie-in. They read selections from Narrative Life of Frederick Douglass. That's really important they read this because there's this great passage in Narrative of Life of Frederick Douglass where he's 13 years old and he's struggling to read and he has to hide to do this. Um, and, you know, he's 13 years old. This, this seems to be this great connection. But here's the thing. Because this was a, initially a digital program, when students were first using this program, and we still do this, we gather all kinds of data, right? Page views, student responses, time on task. And here's what we found with Frederick Douglass. Students were answering the questions and not reading the text. That's what we found. It's like, how can we engage students in this amazing piece of literature? Well, fortunately, um, we have an office in New York. We have access to Broadway actors. So we got a, t a group of Broadway actors together to reenact key scenes, dressed up in period costume, reenact key scenes from Narrative Life Frederick Douglass, made the videos, put them online. And guess what? Kids watch the videos, but guess what? They still didn't read the text. They still didn't read the text. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were on to something. That was the big thing. We're on to something. And it, I, in sitting in a room like this, we started thinking, well, what can we do to make that connection more powerful? And we thought, somebody said, I've got a connection with Chadwick Boseman. You guys know Chadwick Boseman? Maybe not. Maybe. Maybe not. You know the movie um, 42? He played Jackie Robinson. Um, Thurgood Marshall, 
he played Thurgood Marshall, and recently, Black Panther, right? Let's contact Chadwick Boseman and see if he wants to help us out. Let's so contact Chadwick Boseman and said, would you mind reading some passages from Marriage to the Life of Frederick Douglass? He said, wow, this is like the role of a lifetime. I'll dress up like Frederick Douglass, we'll make a video. We're like, no, we already tried that. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. So now, when students begin reading Narrative of Life of Frederick Douglass, here's what they see. Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, Chapter 1. I was born in Tuckahoe, near Hillsborough, and about 12 miles from Easton in Talbot County, Maryland. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing it. By far, the larger part of the slaves know as little of their ages as horses know of theirs. And it is the wish of most masters within my knowledge. So, that goes on for about 13 minutes. And this was electric. Having students just watch Chadwick Bozeman, who they know and love, read that. Students follow along, and then what we found was that all of that data started spiking because it was the first 13 minutes, and the kids were, well, why does he read some more? I want to know more. No, you have to read on your own now. And that made a big difference. And it's that kind of thought, it's that kind of thinking. Um, for example, in seventh grade also, students read passages from Romeo and Juliet. Now think about that. What grade do students most, most time read, right? It's ninth grade. You know this. High school teacher, right there. Good job. Ninth grade. Romeo and Juliet. But think about it. In seventh grade, they read passages from that. And what happens as a ninth grade teacher? What do you do? You read the play, and it take, and it's like it, they read the whole thing. Um, I taught tenth grade as well, and read Julius Caesar. It's the same type of thing. Students would plow through it, acting it out, and then you pull video from like the Leonardo DiCaprio version to show little clips of it. Well, in seventh grade, students read those key scenes, but side by side with that key scene. <laughs> Is the actual actors acting there? A cop close in my true love's hand. Poison. I see it in its timeless end. So students are exposed at seventh grade to Shakespeare. And this was, again, another idea that kind of came through over time and developed over time. And then, um, Picking certain selections, like in eighth grade, students have this great collection called the Frida and Diego collection. And they read about the relationship between Frida Kahlo and Diego Garcia, the Mexican artists. And it's fascinating because Frida had, a, if you've seen the movie Frida, uh, it's fantastic, some high accent. And um, th this relationship that they had, Diego was much older than Frida. And they read this passage that Frida writes about watching Diego paint. And she describes him. And Diego is actually not a very attractive man, and she kind of pulls no punches and talks about the way that he looks in not a very nice way, but she's also admiring him at the same time. And after they read that, they read Shakespeare's Sonnet 130, My Mistress Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun. And they compare those two pieces. But then we ask them to pick one of these animals, as you can see, they're slightly unattractive animals, <laughs> and write a love letter to one of these animals. <laughs> so it's that concept of trying and failing and, and enhancing and tweaking and making that work that really makes a difference. Now the overall program itself, as I've said, six units for each grade level, and they are thematic, which can help support some of those teachers that may be having trouble making that shift. How do I teach uh, pieces that are related? And there are six. And it's not designed for teachers to get through six units in a year, OK? Because what we find mostly is that teachers get through about four units. Now they can kind of uh, pick and choose a little bit, but unit A is the unit to start with because unit A contains the, the first two weeks of unit A is all about just getting acclimated to using Amplify. It's kind of built in. The lesson design getting students and teachers ready to um, to understand that lesson design. And as I said, it was originally designed as a digital program. The digital tools support every single teachable moment. But that does not mean it doesn't have print. 
there are print resources that support that deep analysis. Every piece that a student would read in any one of those units is in a printed student anthology. So students can use that, annotate that, mark that up if they want to. And I really think it's important to teach students how to use a pen and a pencil and, and mark things up in a highlighter. Right? They have that, and it also gives teachers a sense of security as well. I've got this back up. It's on. It's in print. And then their homework that's done every day is in a solo workbook. So that's their take-home homework book if they want to use that. And then the teachers have teacher guides for each unit, and then also uh, a book of unplugged lessons. Now, I understand you, we're, we're, we feel comfortable with Chromebooks and bandwidth and where they're going to be in those schools, but there will be those days where, for some reason, the internet's down. <laughs> and that's the purpose of those unplugged lessons. For every lesson in Amplify Science, there's an unplugged companion that you can use just in case you don't waste a day or try to scramble trying to figure out what to do um, on, the, on those days where you don't have that kind of access. Can I ask you a question yes. about that? Are those like uh, scripted, for lack of a better word, the unplugged manuals? or The unplugged lessons will follow what happens in the teacher guide. This teacher okay. guide is kind of scripted, okay. kind of outlined. But okay. then the unplugged takes the place of what students would normally be putting in online. Okay. okay. Rather than doing it that way, there's a print piece that will help them do that. Um, now, one thing when you're talking about ELA, and ELA lit experts understand this, a staircase of increasing text complexity is important. It's uh, it was written way back in the Common Core language, but think about typical K-5. What happens in a K-5 classroom at the beginning of the year? Students read at a certain level of complexity, and hopefully by the end of the year, students are reading more complex text, right? For some reason, up until this, that all kind of goes out the window at sixth grade. And teachers are uh, teaching pieces that, that don't follow any sequence of complexity. That's not the way that Amplify works, OK? It, if you teach from um, uh, unit A to unit G, what you're going to see, I know you can't read this here. We can give you the actual data. but. Um, the text becomes more complex throughout the year. And you know the standards um, can be taught with a variety of different texts. You can gauge standards mastery on a variety of different texts. So the standards actually kind of spiral through this. But by the end of the year, students are reading some really challenging, complex text um, compared to what they're reading at the beginning of the year. And that includes both the qualitative and quantitative measures. So uh, students are challenged in this way. So te teachers want to teach it in sequence. They can. Okay, and do that. Yes? So you mentioned that there's four units a year, and I noticed there were some science units there. Yes. Is that, would, would that be taught during the science block, or would that, is, that, is that in the ELA? This is really a core ELA program. Okay. You know, it's not, it's, it, there are some great science units in here that can help support what happens in science, but it's not meant to be taught. Like your middle school science teacher wouldn't pick this up and say, I'm going to use this instead of my, um, you know, seventh grade science book. Sure. But this idea that stu you know, students read from the beginning of the year from less challenging to more challenging, actually, when you dig into an actual unit, like this is a seventh grade unit called Brain Science, and there are 26 individual lessons in this unit. And students actually read and focus on three key pieces in Brain Science. The first piece students read is Phineas Gage. Anyone familiar with Phineas Gage? What's the story of Phineas Gage? That's right. <laughs> Phineas Gage, the mine worker who was working in the mine back in the um, 18th century, and a giant metal spike went through his head, and the spike was pulled out, and he lived, but his personality changed. And so he became um, kind of the, the first case in modern brain science. Harvard, you know, he went off to Harvard, and they studied his case and all this. And students learned a lot about brain science by reading Phineas Gage. But Students don't read Phineas Gage because his case was the foundation of modern brain science. Students read Phineas Gage because on page two, a giant metal spike goes through a guy's head <laughs> yeah. at his middle school, right? Yeah. That's why they read it. But after they read this piece, students read informational text from a book called Demystifying the Adolescent Brain. And why would they be interested in something like that? Because they have those, right? <laughs> Yeah, I have an adolescent brain. So students read that, and here's what they find. After they read this, 
they find that the adolescent brain is very similar to the brain of Phineas Gage after the spike went in the head. <laughs> and then they go online and they do a quest. And this quest online, they actually research different brain disorders and how those brain disorders are, ma are manifested in behavior. And they actually have to, there's these activities that they do where they kind of take on a brain disorder and they um, have to describe and act that out to other people and they have to do the research and figure out what that brain disorder is. And the reason why they do that is because the last piece that they read is something they've never read in middle school. It's an Oliver Sacks, <laughs> it excerpts from Oliver Sacks, Sacks' book. He was a great doctor, you know, if you remember that, um, Robin Williams played him in that movie. I forget the name of that movie now. Um, but, uh, Awakening, right? Yes, very good. And and the person out, the brain disorders that they study are based on characters that they read in the man who mm -hmm. mistook his wife for him. So it's this tight connection. And what happens here? They start again from this kind of less challenging to more complex text within mm -hmm. a unit. But it's all tightly woven together with a lot of cool activities and those kinds of things. So let's dig in a little bit real quick and see, and see what it actually looks like in one piece that a student would read, right? Um, recognize this guy? That's Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe, all middle school students at some point or another, in seventh or eighth grade usually, read Poe, okay? And in this case, uh, in the seventh grade book, there's this great unit on poetry and Poe, and they read um, Poe. And if they read this particular paragraph, I won't make you read it out loud, but this is usually the, te what, um, can anybody tell me real quick? Tell tell hard. you know this. Think about that. This is usually students' first ever exposure to Edgar Allan Poe. Think about your typical seventh grader, your typical eighth grader. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous that I had been an end, but why will you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things of the heaven and the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. Think about your typical seven or eight grades. Are they already off base? Yeah. All right. After paragraph one. And here's what usually happens. As instructional coaches, you know this because teachers go to workshops and they learn about rigor and they say, I've got to ask more rigorous questions. So after students would read these two paragraphs, the typical rigorous question that they might get is, make a claim about whether or not you can trust this narrator's account of the events in this passage and use evidence from the text to support two or three reasons for your answer, right? It's a claim, text-based, textual uh, evidence type of question. Can students answer that question usually at the first time they read it? No, we want them to, we want them to be able to do that. But in Amplify, here's what happens. They read these two first paragraphs, and they listen to it, a professional oh, reading of this. Very, very nervous. I have been that time. And then it says, take a moment to try to visualize what the narrator described. So just, just think about it, visualize it, and then sketch a picture on a paper or a drawing program or write a sentence or two in the box about what you visualize. What are you seeing as you read? That's that really important question that we want to, you know, well, we want to encourage students to keep turning the pages. You think how to visualize. So what are you seeing as you read? So think about that personalization. You know, in that collaboration, you might have students doing this together. And then as a teacher, what I can do very quickly is pop up a sketch artist rendering of this piece. And this is the way that a professional artist viewed those two paragraphs. And they compare those two things. And then the next thing they do is look at those paragraphs again, and now they answer a couple of quick two-choice questions. What do you think the narrator means in these same paragraphs? We're rereading it, and, we're, and they have to pick now if the, if, the, uh, if the narrator thinks he's insane or if the narrator is not true about himself. And students still may need another um, illustration of this. So the teacher can actually... Um, have students perform a skit. And you can actually, this one, you actually can get the principal involved in your skit as well, um, which is kind of fun uh, to come in and, and immediately, you know, um, 
do something that's, that happens in the classroom where students are acting out, but it also kind of uh, reinforces what happens in the classroom. So we've acted things out, we've seen it, we've drawn it, and now what students have the opportunity to do, as they go through the telltale heart, they fill out something that we call, Amplify calls, telltale art. <laughs> okay, here's what it is. It's a storyboard. And students have choices below of characters. They can add police to those scenes. And for each scene, for, for example here, we're looking at the narrator's perspective. How would I fill this in? I can add dialogue as well. But notice up here, I actually do this twice. I do it from the narrator's perspective, and I do it for the reader's perspective because if you're familiar with Telltale Heart, <laughs> what the narrator thinks is happening in the story is totally different than what the reader gets. And so the, te the student actually can compare those perspectives and present those to the class. This is how I filled out my storyboard. All right. Then, this question, remember that question? That's actually the writing prompt for those two paragraphs. But they've done a lot. Now can they come back and make that claim and answer it? Yes, and it kind of teaches them this protocol that they work with. And by the time that then it comes back to that question, they're prepared and they're confident and they don't shut down immediately. Right? We develop them as readers. After they read the Telltale Heart, they read the Monotony Rule. And the Monotony Rule is simply uh, the legal definition of insanity from 1843. And students divide up into two teams. And they determine, they each make a case, was the narrator legally insane according to this? Or was he not legally insane according to this? And they actually write their defense. And they argue that case in class. That's what happens. This is how it looks like. This is what it looks like online. And I show it to you. And then finally, when they get um, done reading poetry uh, from Edgar Allan Poe, and they, and they get done reading The Telltale Heart, then they go on a quest in this unit. And their quest in this unit is, who killed Edgar Allan Poe? And that's what they have to find out. Because Edgar Allan Poe appears Things aren't looking good for Edgar Allan Poe. So students watch these little video snippets at the beginning of class, and then they start to do their research, and they get a different file every day, and they get the official report of his death, and then they get information on different suspects, for example, Lenore, or Annabelle Lee, or The Raven, and what ends up happening is students are exposed to all kinds of different literature from Poe as they collect their evidence to determine, and they actually look at Poe's residence <laughs> and all of this, and it's kind of, you know, it's like Clue. They have to fill out, you know, different reasons why possibly it could be the Raven or possibly it could be the Lenore or possibly it could be Annabelle Lee. And then, at the end, they determine who killed Edgar Allan Poe. Remember when I talked about trying and failing and improving until it works? First year, we did this, and it actually is in this really, also really cool box that looks like a murder mystery game. Some of it's online, some of it's in print. It's really cool. Um, first year that we did this, feedback was, our kids love this. But my first period kids were telling my sixth period kids <laughs> who killed Edgar Allan Poe. So now this quest has three alternate endings. <laughs> okay. Trying and failing and proving to make um, to see how it works. Do you guys want to actually see how it works? Do you got a minute to log in? Do you want to log in into my class? Yep. Yep. Can you do that? Okay. Here's what you need to do. I'll show you. I'll give you one of these. And, uh, if you have one. This is, um, I've set up a, a little Greenville class here for you guys. And if you can go to this site and then it's demo, uh, demo hyphen account dot learning dot amplify dot com and then your username you all have a different number that's the thing your student number is different because you're in my class and so this use the student number that's on your paper and then what I'm going to do is get my class set up so do you, all of you have a paper you have a variety of numbers I hope which is good 
and your password is amplify number one. Tessie, can you check and make sure we're they're going on the right way? Because it's s whatever your number is dot Greenville at tryamplify.net. <coughs> And eventually, you will come to a page that looks like this. And it says, Amplify Curriculum in a Word. Do we have to put the at tryamplify.net on the username? Yes. OK. Looks like we're doing that. We're getting there. Nope. Did I do it? No. I Sure, we're in. Okay, we're loading, so you know it works. Give you a second. And this is just a demo account, and here's what I've done I've set you up into my class. Okay, so as you get in, I'm going to log in too, so I can get in here. I've set you up into my class in the curriculum so that you can see what it looks like. And I'm in as a teacher. You can get in and look around wherever you want. Um, and we're going to actually look at this lesson, but it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, but a couple things I want to show you as you're logging in. I think this is really important. As I said, the lessons are designed in small chunks, right? So in this case, in this lesson brief, it says there are eight activities. And these activities, think about a lesson being, and we've refined it over time, of about a 45 minute chunk of time, 45 minute block of time to cover one of these lessons. And there are eight activities within that 45 minutes. So the first one is always vocabulary, as I said. So I'm kind of jumping into lesson three where we're, we've been in the telltale heart for a little while. Um, but students do the vocabulary. And then they discuss and evaluate the narrator's claim. And then the teacher, as an individual, and the teacher comes back and talks about the reader's perspective. And then students work in groups visually to determine, to, um, uh, to draw pictures of that reader's perspective. We have trouble over here? You got it? You're in? Yeah, she, it's just not funny. She's got everything right. Oh, no, I don't. I put dot com. Oh, it's not net. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I know it's a little tricky. Yep, help okay. me here. I'm just thinking in yeah. terms of where we are in terms of teacher management. Yeah. When we start out, are we doing whole group? We're doing this lesson in a whole group? It might. No. In this case, think about it this way. Students actually collaborate in the beginning. Okay. Or they're working either, and it will say either individually or they're working together okay. to do one piece. Let's take a look at it. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that students do here is a vocabulary activity. But before I do that, I'm in this lesson brief page. So you can see this gives me an overview, the prep work that I have to do for this lesson, lesson objective, words to use. And each one of these is a little drop down. And all of this is in my teacher guide. Okay, All this is in my teacher guide as well. But it tells me everything that I'm going to be doing. But then when I get to each one of these little activities, like I can click on the vocabulary activity, and it tells me that in that vocabulary activity, what I'm doing is, um, is I'm working in that vocabulary activity with a poll. Okay, based on what you know about this narrator's actions now, how would you respond to that question, am I mad? Because um, that's one of the vocabulary words that they have to figure out is, is that meaning of the word mad in context. And they're also working in the app. And then in this individual piece right here, the second part of that lesson, okay, what students are doing is they're working either in pairs or as one group, and they're responding to these questions. What is the narrator decides to making the following sound, a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton? Is the old man alive or dead? So we're asking students those really important comprehension questions so that when we get to that rigorous piece, they're ready for it. And then the teacher leads a discussion on what they have learned. So here are the questions that when you talk, this is where the whole group comes. Students do some individual work first. So there's not this expectation that my teacher every day is going to get up and we're going to start class. It's not that way. Okay. It's um, instead, I've done a little bit, and now let's talk about what you did. 
Let's talk about this. Who found some evidence to suggest the policemen are not hearing a heartbeat? And then students work visually again in that app. And notice that I've got a way for students to do that. And they work visually and they compare perspectives. And, and the students are working in the storyboards. And then I have my students discuss those storyboards. So this kind of lines out my lesson as to what that looks like, OK? No matter where you are. So all of you are in right now? Mm -hmm. I'll show you a couple things. We're here, but I'm going to um, start my class. So if students think about this, every student's on a Chromebook individually. What I do as a teacher, I go to the lesson I want to be at, and I click on this little button, and I click, um, whoops, I'm going to end this class. And then I'm going to click Start Class. What happens to your screen? Can you do that again? <laughs> Please. I'll show you. I'll end it. Sorry. Let me end my class, OK? Oh. And I'll show you. This is how a teacher would start the class. I click this little button up here. You don't have it because you're in my class. <laughs> I click this little button up here, and I click Start Class. These are all my students. These are all the kids in my class. I click Start Class. What happens to your screen? It goes to the lesson that I'm on. So I don't have time because I don't have to have my students navigate to a specific place. Okay? Mm -hmm. And now my students are working, right? I'm getting they're into what they are doing. You guys are all into it, right? You're working. But here's another thing I want you to look at. Okay? On that page, scroll down because on you are in section um, actually click on your um, I'll show you where to click. OK, so you're in that, we're all in that lesson together. And I want you to click on the writing assignment that I'm on, which is section five of that lesson. OK? And you get a box, you get something that looks like this. Do you see that? Warm up? Are you there? Yes. Now click next. And you get a writing prompt. Now. I want you to take a look at the writing prompt that you have and the writing prompt that the person next to you has. Hopefully, if I did this right, they should look different. Do you agree or disagree with the narrator's description of what's happening? So how many different questions, how many different writing prompts are there? The, the bigger question is not how many. How many? The bigger question is why. Why does yours look different than yours? Why does yours look different than yours and yours? We have a middle school time. Well, just... I'll show you. Behind the scenes, you guys are in as, as students, right? I'm in as a teacher. See this thing that says differentiation? Oh. Um, I want to continue. Yeah, it's in, it's in mm -hmm. session. These are all of the students in this class. So some of us are sex smarter. Than some of them, yeah. I've, got, I've got some in I would like to know which level I'm on. OK. I've got some in substantial. I've got some in moderate. I've got some in light and some in challenge. So when you asked about differentiation, OK, there are differentiation tips all over the place in the teacher's guide. But I control this as a teacher. These are all my kids. And what we always tell everybody is at the beginning of the year, put everybody in core, see where they are. And if, they, if you find students need F, X, a lot of help, move more to substantial. And they're going to get a prompt that's going to have, as yours does, sentence frames in it right. that help support that language development if you have students that way. And actually, as I said, trying and failing and keep getting better until it works. When school starts this year, I'm not, has it hasn't been implemented yet, there's going to be another one over here that's English learners. Okay? So that it's going to change. And now the kids don't know. And you can move them any time. Like I can take um, student number 12 here and move him over to substantial. And then next time he'll get that substantial writing prompt. So you can do that. But this, is, this would be a teacher question that I would hear at my school. Yes. Do we have to load all of our students in here? Nope. Nope. You can if you, you want. You have that option. But we'll, we'll load them for you. OK. Yes. And they're all in. Such a teacher question. Now, <laughs> I'm going to go back here because our class is going on. And you guys are really into it. All you are writing and writing your prompts. Actually, somebody answer that. Put an answer in there. Can you can answer your prompt. It doesn't have to be your, uh, based on your expertise of Poe. My 
Mine keeps saying eyes on teacher. What did I do wrong? <gasps> oh, no. Because I did that to you. <laughs> See this little button up here that I clicked on here? It says eyes up. Because you get students who are buried in their Chromebooks, right? Right. I click this. What happens? Eyes on teacher. And it only works when I'm in, within the Amplify system. So if I've got a kid still with his head in the computer, he's not where he's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it also blocks them to where they, I can't go on because you can't That's exactly them. right. I'm trying to get your attention. You know, that happens every once in a while in middle school. So that's the way that that works. <laughs> and then, of course, um, I'll just, you know, I know we're, um, I probably, I, I want to be respectful of your time. But I, want, I do want to show you really quickly here that, um, all of this, the whole concept of this, leads to students reading on their own, students reading independently. And so with Amplify, on this, it, on this same platform, students have access to the Amplify library, which is over 600 full-length titles. Mm -hmm. And students can access those anytime. The design, so that they want to read on their own. So if they've read some, something from Poe, they might want to read something else from Poe. It might be in the library. It probably is. There's 600 titles. And there's classic pieces, there's modern, there's a wide variety of authors. Students can search by title or search by topic. You know, I've got students really into sports. They can read sports books, they can read biographies, nonfiction. Um, you can also search by Lexile. There are all kinds of things. And the big question that you'll get from teachers also, well, are there lesson plans with these? And the answer to that is no. The reason why is because these aren't designed that way. They're not designed to be assigned. You can assign them if you really want to, but and you can probably find support for a lot of it. But they're designed for students to read. You know, that student choice you were talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to read something. Um, I can pick a topic that I'm interested in. Maybe it's nonfiction. Something that's really challenging on there. I want to challenge myself. You can do that. And these are full-length titles, downloadable as well, so they can download them on their Chromebook. Actually, I can't download a Chromebook, I guess. But. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> they can put them on a flash drive, I guess, and take them home with them. They want to do it that way. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about to help you and help teachers is data. Understand that those that whatever you answered, if you filled in your answer there, I can look at it immediately, but it's also automatically scored. And that happens with every single piece of every single lesson. So if there's something that a student has to respond to, I immediately get that in my gradebook and I can copy, I can comment directly back to that student as a teacher. I can do that. There are a full range of assessments, those kinds of assessments that you would traditionally think of, formative and summative. There's all kinds of embedded formative assessment, obviously, benchmarks as well. But those assessments that happen at the end of each unit give students a new passage to read and give them the types of questions that they would see on standardized tests. You know how students now, I know that this year's testing intensity was kind of a debacle, but <laughs> if students were to read those on the computer and there's different types of, of questions, the drag and drop, the highlight questions, the more than, you know, more than one response questions, all that's available in those assessments as well. And then everything, every piece, you'll see this is the, this is the grade book that comes with Amplify. Each one of these stands for those little segments of each lesson. So each segment of that lesson is recording data from students. If they had to do something and it was handed in, I know it's handed in, I can take a look at it really quickly and give it a score if it's not auto-scored. And it collects all of that data so I can really drill down. And then anything that a student writes to is automatically scored. Not by the teacher, but it's automatically scored on conventions and focus on a rubric, four-point rubric. And then as a teacher, you can go in and override it. And we also include a teacher scored uh, area of use of evidence. If the teacher really wants to zero in and hone in on um, uh, students' use of evidence. And all of that also is recorded. And the other thing that's really important for middle school students is, um, is uh, pro productivity. Teachers can set a goal that I want each one of those short response questions to be, you know, students to set a goal of writing 120 words. And then over time, all of that is graphed. All your comprehension scores are graphed, but also all your productivity is graphed. But to me, the most important, and this is all standard, you know, how is my student performing data? But the, the most important piece of data that's in the Amplify gradebook, I think, is this. 
And I know it doesn't make sense to you right now. All these little dots here represent something. All these names are names of my students. These dots represent the number of comments that I have written to an individual student. I don't know about you, but I had, in middle school, 130 kids a day. And I bet if I had something like this, I would see there were kids I was responding to all the time. And there were some that were falling through the cracks. This is data for me to say, you know, I might want to check in on Mary a little bit more than I am right now. I might want to comment back. Because teacher feedback, especially at middle school, is so critical. So critical. And so this is a way um, for you as a teacher to uh, keep track of how many times you're responding to students online. So that's Amplify You, right? And we'll probably Do students have access to that, their information like that? Can they see? Students can see their scores over time and their productivity over time. Okay. Yes. Students can see that. And um, it's a great tool. And when we, um, you know, we'll work with you. I don't, you know, there's obviously going to be, um, as you implement this, some kind of a training model we use. We have experts in Amplify ELA who can help, um, you know, if, if you want to use like a train the trainer model or work with teachers. Um, and then there's one more thing, though, in that online piece, if I'm back here, that I didn't point out. Oh, and you can't see it here. That's another problem because you can't see it. But. In this little corner down here, there's not, it's not here for some reason because of the resolution of this. But in that little corner is a comment box. And if I click on that comment box, it automatically connects me to a real live person um, who can help with any tech questions that you might have. It's instant tech help. It's not, you don't have to call tech support. Mm -hmm. It's like a chat feature. Yeah, it's a like a chat feature. Yeah. So that's an overview of Amplify ELA. Um, but, uh, but at this point, you know, first reaction, questions? questions? You know where you had um, the Black Panther reading Frederick Douglass? Yes. Can you turn on closed caption on that? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that would be good for students. It is closed caption. Read it while they're yes. Up. Yes. What we do, what we want students to do is to follow along. And right. so they do. Um, and that's also, we can give you, we can give you that in print, the actual print version of the book. They can follow along. Is this meant to be the curriculum or a supplement? It's meant to be the curriculum. It's completely standards aligned. Um, we could provide a correlation to the Tennessee standards if you want, but it's completely standards aligned. It's designed to be used as a curriculum. Um, we have a lot of schools uh, using it right now. And it will or, be the one that we yeah. submit to the state yes. for the state adoption as well. And we will submit well, it to the state, yes. Yes. And that's and one of the things we're working with with the state is this is different and we have to get the state to kind of wrap their heads around this as well because what they have required in the past is you submit something for a six year time frame or however long it is you can't make changes to it right kind of defeats the purpose we're having conversations with them because we want you always to have the latest and greatest without having to like buy an upgrade so you're looking at this program. Program. As textbook adoption. As textbook yeah, adoption, so it will be submitted. For obviously. Yeah, it would be a part of the textbook adoption as well. So this is almost like an amped up uh, version of Louisiana <laughs> Beliefs kind of, mm. but on steroids kind of. It's, like. Yeah, it's kind of unlike anything that's, that's why I can't. It has, this, a, lot, it has yeah. a lot more components to mm -hmm. it than what. Yeah, yeah. You, there's a lot of components and materials. A lot, well, a lot more technology and interaction besides right. just the curriculum and the it's things It's just not like but it's, right, right, right. The, right, When exactly. you, think about, you think about working with your teachers, you what's, nice is, exactly. what's nice is, is that each lesson is planned out, activity to activity to activity. That does not mean that teachers have to use every single activity in a lesson. But what it does is it says, you know, on Monday, this is what Monday could look like. What do I want Monday to look like? I can pick and choose. Rather than a blank slate saying, you know, that big blank Monday, how do I fill in my 50 minutes? This is 50 minutes, now how do I make this work for me? 
So yeah. say I taught, and I, and I could, I turned, maybe I'm moving ahead, but yeah. I, I saw the actionable item feedback, which again, from an yes. instructional planning perspective, you know, when you're trying to make decisions. So say I collected, for example, all my answers on this mm -hmm. prompt that you have up there. Yeah. Is there um, support built in, or is that, I guess, provided by me a way to go back and reteach or adjust my instructional pace based off the needs of particular classes that I'm working with? Yes. I didn't say it the right way. I, I probably didn't ask that question in the right way, but... but yeah, there is there is um, a way for you to do that. There's a, There are a couple things Making that happen. New okay. assignments based like, on what they're struggling right, with. Right, on their yeah. needs. Yes, right. yes, yeah. yes, yes, you can absolutely do yes, that. And we do totally have recommendations for yes. the additional we do that. workflow. And one of the nice things that um, that you have with that is the ability based on the data that you get to move students into different categories so that their book appears different, so that they get the kind of support that they need. And those and those assignments are kind of automatically differentiated. Mm -hmm. Can I chime mm -hmm. into that? Sure. Because the book looks different, but they're still reading the same text. We yes. don't modify just based on, we actually it's build more scaffolding. It's yes, it's an, yes ma'am. Yes. So there's not level texts of no, not like within if, the like book. Like if I'm struggling and, and chastity is soaring, mm -hmm. we're reading the same book, but I've got more built-in support to right. help me work mm -hmm. through the, the book okay. than she needs. Mm -hmm. Will that be, ba and this, I'm sorry, if that's... No, please that do, be that's why we got Alexander yeah, here as well. So, <laughs> yes, if Will I that be based it. off the response I have that the teachers put into the, the expectations, or is that built into the system? Does that make sense? Like, if it's a multiple choice question, obviously there's a right or wrong that it will give. So if it's if I get all of my multiple choice questions wrong, will it place me in one of those or will I need no, to do that as a teacher? You need to do that. You have entire okay. control over that. Okay. Yes. We um that was one of those big debates because it would be easier for us to do that yeah. algorithmically. But with middle school kids you know them it could be bad. way better. You know the kids. Or something. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. yeah. And kid. you need the yeah. flexibility to move around, you know, from um, one to another as well. Writing group <laughs> No, please. So, so like yes. SRSD has is, is been in our state for a while. Yes. Um, but we are moving to, we don't, we, we haven't really discussed a lot of that with the state in terms of what exactly, but that's what we have been using. Mm -hmm. If that is something that we continue to use, is it possible to put in some SRSD rubrics that we have created or that, that teachers have been using um, in terms of feedback? Or is, oh, I don't know. Alexander, do you hear her? She's wondering, can we import rubrics into the platform? Is that what you're asking? Yes. 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 Uh-oh, hold on. I must have you on mute. I'm sure you're saying something great. Hold on. <laughs> Are you with us, Alexandra? She is. She's okay, talking. Cool. I can't hear you. They let her see me. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. No, I, I want to... I want to say the answer to that question is no. Okay. Um, but there are ways for teachers that, you know, if you're going to put it, if they have a, an LMS, they have a learning management system of some sort um, where they, you know, can post and share lessons, you know, you could do that there. If they're aligned with the state standard, we may do something yeah. where they're aligning to the state rubric. Yeah. You know, and not just individually doing the. Mm -hmm. Right. I know she's typing me. I'm going to check my phone. That's what the option will have in the spring for implementation next year. Right. It's, an, it's a 1920 um, adoption year. Mm -hmm. 19 evaluation. And then. Like the textbook committees, are they already meeting with people? Like right now, like that would be people are just giving time. feedback on the rubric right now. They yeah, yeah that's, I'm thinking timeline of when. Mm -hmm. So, do you typically charge per seat per student, or is it a site license, or is it a per student license? It is a per student license. Mm -hmm. Per yeah, per student license, and then there are um, uh, pricing is pricing for the print materials as well. And of course, there's all kinds of different configurations. I think, Chassie, I think we did a little, we did a few We've got pricing some. options to kind of give you an idea based on the numbers that we had. You want to talk about that? Do you want you want to talk about that? 
Do not really. We want it free. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we thought it might be better to, to have it, we you know, it with you guys, and then we can talk about it. Because, you know, not knowing numbers and sure. things like that, it's really, it's a different kind of conversation. Yeah. yeah. And, and everything. Did you get um, an answer from her? <laughs> On that, will they not? She did. The answer, uh, Jeff was correct. You cannot do that. But they can rate the students on those metrics. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I, I think I know the answer to this, just thinking through what you've said, but is there is there an, a remediation or intervention component at all, or is it just basically a core curriculum? This is a core curriculum. As far as it, like an intensive intervention program, um, this is not that. Now, that said, if you if if you're working with schools that have designated intervention time and they're using something maybe like a read 180 or something like that where they're sitting kids at a computer i ready whatever it might be um we have just built a new uh program that we call amplify close reading which is entirely independent designed for that except it's only designed for 45 minutes a week of screen time and it is uh, it's brand new and it focuses on the key areas that students need to be successful so it's not it doesn't work like from foundational skills all the way up it works much more on um, micro comprehension which is reading for um, <laughs> understanding of key words in text that make a difference like transition words and because in those words or using evidence to help develop a persuasive argument. And it's all set up, what's great about it is we've got all these great developers in New York. And it's set up, the student takes on a character and has to navigate a dystopian universe, which is what, which this dystopian world, which is really what middle school kids are into anyway. <laughs> A world has been taken over by machines and the only way to get out is to read and to be able to convince and as they go through this and they learn more rather than like gaining points or credits they gain followers because <laughs> that's what kids are all about and if they get enough followers they can break out of the dome and move into the machine but that's a different it's a it's designed for intervention it's designed for that but it's separate from this program because it's more student directed this is really is it, designed is it cool. live what is that is that live is it? it's live right now right okay. or amplified yeah i just learned about it recently it's brand new uh, but we just we just tested it in 100 different places and got really great results just in 45 minutes a week mm -hmm. but uh, maybe can just get it amplified.com and just um, click it look at Amplify reading, or it's actually called the Last Readers. The name of the game, the Last Readers. Are so the anthologies consumable? The anthologies, Maybe. it's weird. You can use them differently. Yeah, it's a hard copy of the text. Okay. And some teachers uh, use them for students to mark up, but it's not a consumable in the traditional sense that there are spaces for students to fill in. The solo workbook is designed that way. It's like a take-home workbook where they write in it. The anthology just has the text in it, but a lot of teachers want students to write and mark up those texts, so it can be. And, and for our next iteration, it will be consumed. Okay. It ha mm -hmm. will have a different format than it has today. As what Jeff was saying, That's that we're always improving it. So it'll, um, same stories, different format, and it'll look um, it'll have some of the areas for you to make annotations and write and encourage that activity in print as well. Uh, mimics a lot of things that you see online. You can now do it in the book. Okay. Yes. So Tennessee textbook adoption, um, we've talked about that cycle, yeah. but other states have different cycles. So Absolutely. Mm -hmm. this, you, you're, you're up and running in several other states and under several different contracts. And, yeah. And yes. Yes. Yeah, we're um, we're small, so we and we have to pick and choose our spots. Um, California is one where we're up and running in a lot of districts in California. Um, I'm actually headed out there later today. No, that's right. And we've got um, users across um, 
the country and mm -hmm. other in other areas. Um, speaking just for the southeast, we will be focusing it um, here in Tennessee and in Florida. And Georgia doesn't go through an adoption anymore, but they kind of stay on the same cycle. And so we will be, you know, presenting it there as well. So there's um, there are a lot of places. And you mentioned Louisiana Belize. We do a lot of work in Louisiana, but this was not quite ready. Um, and we're waiting for this this roll around to go. Couldn't help but when we were kind of looking, noticing core knowledge. Mm -hmm. Is that is that the is that kind of the curriculum driver for this in that sense? It, it's it, we publish the CKLA, the core knowledge okay. K five curriculum. Okay. And yes. so a lot of what's happening now developmentally as we continue to build amplify ELA is figuring out ways to build students' knowledge, especially science and social studies topics, as, yeah. And so we're seeing more and more of that because it's more and more tightly aligned. Okay. Yeah. Because I know like in Sullivan County here, C oh, yeah. CKLA yes. is big. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I just, are they using it? Are they going to be using it? I don't know. We got to talk to them. <laughs> well, let's say, let's we got yeah, we got to talk to them because the CKLA is a, it is we're, a lot of schools in um, Tennessee are using CKLA and it's been great <laughs> and uh, and CKLA is another one that um, Amplify will put on the um, state bid for the next. Is adoption. that right? Just to talk a little bit about that. Is that for my own learning yeah. because I do I have reviewed some uh, mm -hmm. different publishers with Ed reports myself. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, um, but just thinking about. CKLA, is that true that that one of the writers for the Common Core came up with and created that curriculum? It, I'm not even sure okay. on that. It was a, I know it, it yeah. came from the Cornell Foundation okay. and um, probably was. I want to say, hold on, they work closely with many creators of Common Core, okay. is what Alexandra says, because she oh, is the okay, lady who's done it, so yes. <laughs> and Amplify She's ELA listening. is all green in the Ed Reports as well. I noticed that. Yes. And as well as CKLA. Yes. I love this texting. This is so great. I feel like so cool, right? Okay. Good. <laughs> it's kind of like having right followers. <laughs> they can, yeah. She can hear us. It must be my connection. Saw, I saw the picture something. of her sitting in the, she was yes. sitting in the room by herself. Yes. No, she was great, but yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love saying mm -hmm. yes. And uh, anything else? Any other questions? So let, let me ask some folks. So how did we? How did this question even come up? I mean, so who asked about Amplify? Did some of our schools we ask were, about Pittman it? Center did. Pittman Pardon? Center did, and then um, we were looking at some programs that we felt like were just too expensive for what they were providing. As an alternative to things they did ask for. Right, so we were looking at it as an alternative okay. for some, some of the things that schools were looking for. And the school, and I, I have in mind in particular, is much more interested in, in an intervention. Uh, so I'm, I'm okay. looking at the close reading right yeah. now. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and that's the t that's the tear that it, that we're all in. It's that the idea that we have so many needs in intervention, and what is it is it is it a tier one problem? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's the that's the question. And when I look at a lot of this, it feels like when I think about the rigor and a lot of these lessons mm -hmm. that I'm seeing is that yeah. in terms of consistency and this lesson, I'm even thinking, reflecting on my own teaching, it makes me go, oh, my gosh, the, the, the stamina it would take me, me as a teacher to prepare and present and oh. have ready this information for my children on a day-to-day -day basis would be at a breakneck pace. I mean, I, oh, mm -hmm. I was pretty good. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I kid, I kid. But I'm just saying it's just it's it's overwhelming to kind of process, you know, mm -hmm. the the stamina as a teacher it mm -hmm. would take, and the the knowledge that I would build as a reader myself, mm -hmm. going through certain pieces of this text. I don't know if that knowledge has been built in a way that people mm -hmm. understand why it's important. Yeah. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do that. We do provide that type of support. Oh, absolutely. Teachers. Yeah. Professional development. Type. Yes, yes, professional we, health yes. and even things just online that'll help them as they're preparing. We didn't even get into some of the teacher. Because yeah, why is kind of the big question. Like people yes. are going to go, this is too hard. And, and then like, why am I even doing this? My kids can't even read. Well, but it's, it's, but it's, it's rigorous, but it's been done for them. If they right. Just, that's that's right. why I like it. And it's yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the whole it's, thing is they've got to do it. And it, it, it builds to rigor is what happens. Um, what we like to say is it's a low threshold, high ceiling program. At the beginning when students read, like with Telltale Heart, 
draw, you know, read these two paragraphs, visualize, draw a picture. And eventually we're asking them to defend the narrator based on 1843's de legal definition of insanity. I mean, that's where they get, but it builds to them in each one of the selections. That's really the way that it works. And teachers don't usually see it until after it happens. <laughs> and uh, and it's really, it's really we uh, work with a lot of districts, you know, especially out in California, a lot working with user districts. And one piece of feedback that we constantly hear is, um, my kids love this. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, going back to that idea, how do you inspire students to read the text? You have to make them want to come into English class every day so and enjoy it. I know, obviously, you said there's yeah. there's pen and paper things in case yeah. things go. But also, there's sometimes kids um, lose the privilege of having technology for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. um, so does it still? I mean, it's still pair with what some kids are doing online, and some kids are having to do pen and paper. You know, or you may have a kid who's you know. Mm -hmm lost their computer for some reason. Well, the yeah. internet works in first period and it doesn't in second period. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. I think in the and same class happen. where you have different, I mean, I've been in situations where I've had to print off because they're not allowed mm -hmm. internet access. That's right. right. And that's where those unplugged lessons come in. So you may have to print off those unplugged lessons. They parallel oh. what happens in that, okay, in that online right. lesson. Yes. Okay. So you can do that. So you're not missing any instruction. Yeah. Um, going back to another, um, about some of the users that you mm -hmm. were asking about, we're in Tulsa, yes. which is, you know something very relevant, um, and also in Miami Dade uses us in um, in their academies that are something that sounds like what y'all are building here um, as well. So is it big politics here at all in Tennessee? In Tennessee? Mm -hmm. We're all brand new to Tennessee, which is kind of fun for us. This is uh, a great opportunity, but um, yeah, in those places where it has been, like in the in that Miami pilot that. We had, they said, okay, we'll try it out in eight schools. And those eight schools, after the first year, were outperforming their other, it's so, their other schools by so much that they expanded to 20. And it's just going to keep expanding. Are those testimonials on your website? Yes. Okay. Yeah. They, uh, Feedback. A county that Ben and I are both uh -huh. in, they have, they have a pacing guide, and they're told what materials to use. Yeah. Day in, day out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the the county that has been in contact with, with you, has been contacting you guys, mm -hmm. they have a pacing guide as far as which standards that they have to mm -hmm. do each six weeks, mm -hmm. but no materials. So um, uh, how would I present that to the county who is saying, uh, we have you have to read this, 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 use this, 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 in a way that I could convince them to try this. <laughs> You know, maybe as a pilot. Maybe, <laughs> maybe <laughs> as a you know it. it I'm working real really, hard. Um, I should get by with you. In, in in most places, in most places that that have to make that leap, that's that's the case. We you know, we already have materials and we have we have planned this out. Are they getting the kind of results that they want to get mm -hmm. using that? Um, are they seeing you know? Are, are they see, are they seeing results? Are they progressing? You know what ha what happens so much in middle school is that scores flatline or they trend down, and that's why you, that's why you guys are doing what you're doing. So um, it's you know it's convincing them it's time for a different approach in doing that. And this will do. The good thing is if they have that model, every teacher has to teach the same thing and teach to those standards. This is easy to plug into that model. Okay, it's like just wiping the spreadsheet blank and copying and pasting amplify stuff in where that other stuff already was. If they, I mean, they can keep the same, the same columns. Even. I think probably the best thing yeah. that I saw was the actual building component mm -hmm. of not necessarily getting to the, going immediately to that end outcome of what you're yeah. looking for, mm -hmm. which is I think what mm -hmm. most teachers probably do. Mm -hmm. Without those intermediate steps of mm -hmm. how do we how do we get them there? See, it's either they try to do it or they just ignore uh -huh. it. It's That's culminating right. task but, but without knowing without how, the how steps, to get their success. they either don't have the time or don't have the knowledge <laughs> uh -huh. or don't take the time mm -hmm. and use the knowledge to get to get there. Or or um, 
what I've seen is that teachers try to teach it. Is they, you know, they, they put that rigorous question out there, and I'm going to teach my kids how to answer this question by essentially spending 55 minutes answering the question for them. Yeah. Right? Or giving them a reading workshop to read. You know, read these three pages about reading. Well, reading about reading um, when you're trying to be a better reader is a challenge. So instead, let's build to that. And this kind of happens, you know, in, in a kind of almost subliminally where they get to that. Well, and the visual piece yeah. is huge too. Yeah. I mean, like I, I, yeah. I mean, I've read the tell. I, I like Edgar Allan Poe, but that's not my favorite. And so, <laughs> like you know, putting in dialogue yeah. bubbles, that's engaging. And the, and the, um, you know, when they do it, when they read Telltale Heart, the theme for them is read like a movie director. That's how they're reading. So it's not make inferences, <laughs> or you know that it's it's not standards based language for them. Okay, we're going to read like a movie director. We're going to look at the reader's perspective, and then we're going to look at the narrator's perspective, and then we're going to debate that narrator's sanity within that subunit, within those seven lessons. And each one of these lessons then is that stepped out, 45 minute chunk of time. Is there a culminating task between all the different pieces? Because I, you know, there, I know there's, a, like the, yeah, the question for just tell tell heart. Is there something that's tying everything together in the poetry? So you see, we'll read, we'll read, um, and we'll debate the narrator's sanity there, and then they read um, Casca Monteado. And again, um, there is within this a. Uh, oh, there's flex day. A director, yeah, and then there's flex day. And those flex days are built in because teachers say the biggest thing is um, uh, I like to teach, it's funny, I like to teach grammar. And we need more flex time to be able to teach those grammar and conventions and mechanics. And so a lot of times that flex day will move into some kind of grammar related lesson um, if they want to teach it or they can go back and reteach. There's all kinds of different suggestions um, that students have for that flex day. In this case, it's vocabulary, grammar practice, revision, close reading. Um, but it can be a lot of different things. We build in what that flex day might look like, but it doesn't have to look. But within, uh, at the, if I go back to this poetry and Poe unit, you'll see they read um, some, po, uh, some poetry, they read The Raven, and then they write, and then there's a reading assessment that goes along with that. So that's that culminating unit activity. But all along the way, there are formative activities as well. So like as they're reading Cask and we're um, doing that director's reading in here, if they get into a, um, A, uh, let me do one here where they're reading. Whoops. Okay, that's where they watch a movie. But as they're doing writing, where it, in this, I just pick one at random so it's not there, but this will turn red, this little piece right here. <laughs> See where it says, on the fly support? And that little bird gives me a hint. This is designed for me when you're talking about personalized learning or students working in groups, a lot of times teachers need help with, if I'm walking around and kids are on the computer, what am I looking for? What kinds of questions can I ask those individual students? So if I see that students are working in this particular activity, um, if they're identifying those precise details, they're on track. But if they're identifying dialogue is different from the text, they might need some more support. So what can I say? So those little on the fly little formative checks are built in all along the way as well. So it moves it from those things that are as simple as that all the way to those more formal assessments. And then there are four benchmarks. So for a district that might be using, might be saying, we've got to backtrack from the standards, we could map that from those four benchmarks as well. The 600 book selection, are those book selections that are, how do I say this? Or, those aren't created selections by Amplify. Those are actually yeah. books. Oh, they're actual I've, books. I've oh, been looking through them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm in the library right now. You know, classics. So okay. the classics, they're not abridged. They're These are full okay. text. They're full text. Fancy, mystery, romance, science fiction. This is all sports. These are all full text. Um, 
you know, comedy, history, biography. You got any books on skateboarding? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. There's some soccer. Read some about skateboarding, but there's not a whole unit on skateboarding. But, you know, just a huge variety. Huge variety. So, you know, if they're... If they were reading, you know, Poe and they wanted to, you know, now read Dracula or Frankenstein or, you know, they can do that as well. Is there a direct instruction aspect with this where the teachers are actually, and it sounds bad, but... Yeah. Um, in each unit, okay? For example, now the direct instruction is going to be what they need to know to move to the next thing, okay? So in each one of these, in each one of these lessons, for example, here, they're introducing Cast of Monteado by playing videos and discussing those videos. Okay, which these are kind of cool because these are actual, um, like this is a really good one here. Uh, this is actually, you know, acting, uh, kind of introducing this. And then there are, there's a transcript that goes along with it. Very good, you know that. And when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. Okay, so we can go on. Um, it's but very English teachers. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm really like, oh nerdy God. about this stuff. But um, teachers present that, and then students get right into writing and comparing those two different. Because what they watch is they watch two different videos of the same scene, and they have to compare those, and they have to write down the imagery, what they just saw, in those two videos, and how they compare right there in their book. And then when they do that, they click. This button comes live and they click hand in and it automatically goes to me. So the teacher may do a short mini lesson on imagery. That's right. Because not because, I mean, showing them two that's videos right. isn't teaching anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, I guess that's yeah. what I'm asking is where's the yeah. teacher, like the teacher yeah. instructions? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, your that's, teacher that's instructions, that's yeah. Your um, instructional guide for this is going to be. Oh, this see, is notice what I flip, see. I flip yeah. over. Yeah, yeah that's see. why I'm trying to see what yeah. you're doing, not what I'm see. doing. See, this we'll is sure all, yeah, I move over, see, and that's something else. I'm toggling over, this is what the teacher sees. This is what the student sees, okay? When we're watching these videos, okay, this is what the student sees. As you're doing that, this is what the teacher sees as I'm presenting these videos and how I'm introducing those and what I'm saying about those. So every time, you know, when they're doing those writing things, um, when I come back to that uh, whole class discussion, raise your hand if this is what you pictured. You know, when you come back and summarize those images that they've done. So you're guiding the class. As a teacher, you're really in charge. It puts you, you're, you're at the front of every little instructional moment that happens, but you're not talking for 50 minutes. Right. Yeah. But, like, if you look at, like, our standards where it says, like, specifically, analyze figure of language, yeah. something, 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 <coughs> we, would, we would be able to harvest those pieces out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm working that in with not just I'm introducing a video. Right. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Sweet. And, and for, each, for each lesson, for each, yeah. 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 That yeah. for each individual <laughs> lesson that we'll give, you know, we'll, we can provide you with uh, the, the um, standards that they're working on. But it gives you everything, you know, preparation that I'm doing in the overview of this unit. Is there a hard copy for teachers? There is a hard copy of that guy, yes. Did you say we would be able to have access to that to where we can see that something like mm -hmm. that? Yes, we can give yeah, you some examples. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Access. What you have access to right now through this little thing. It's is just his class. class. No, and that's very yeah. helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you can see the teacher. I need more. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, oh, you yeah. need to take the time to make sure it has what you're looking for. Right. Oh yeah. Instructionally. Okay. I know most Great. systems require the teachers to post yeah. weekly in their lesson plans. And their week yeah. Absolutely. So this is what you're covering. So they would yes. right. so they have access yes. to that. Cool. Awesome. <coughs> we'll probably, you know, obviously have some discussion and yeah. look at the school needs and what their interests are and uh, hopefully figure out some kind of way to... Great. And we'll, we'll have a mm -hmm. chance to follow up, but we'll just okay. talk about some pricing before we leave, if that's sure. good. Just okay. to, so you have a <laughs> scope of it and everything. Um, but y'all, thank y'all very much. Yes, thank you. This is fun. This is exciting. Bye, you Alexander. Thank work. you. This is neat. This is really. Should we take a quick break, quick, quick? And then sure. And I have a little something for all of you for sitting so long. As <laughs> well, just a little something. And a little hard to stress. <laughs> 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 oh, 
Give Telltale Heart stressful. Daddy, love you.